Hello and welcome to Property Question Time. I'm Stephen Galpin and this is the show where you can have your property related questions answered by our team of property experts. And today with a slant on architecture and interior design, I've got two people who are going to answer all your queries. Ben Richards, founder of Aura Homes, residential architecture and interior design experts. Welcome to you. Hello. And joining Ben is James Costello, founder of Way Out Property Group, redevelopment and refurbishment specialist. Welcome to you. Thank you. Right, well, we'll get straight on with the questioning. And Ben, you're going first. With the government's proposed lessening of planning restrictions nationwide, do architects believe that this will both speed up and increase the number of approved schemes? I've got a feeling I know what you're going to say on this one. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good question. I think there's there's two issues here. There's there's the policies, but then there's the operations behind it. I think there's a lot of talk about some really good policies um, regards to sort of grey belt areas um, that are ripe for development, but are, have been under the green belt kind of banner for, for many, many years. And I think there are lots of assets and areas that are old car parks, petrol stations. We're talking of, about the grey belt. The grey so. belt, yeah, I think that's a great um, place to be. And I think the way that they've termed it maybe pushes people's mindsets away from this, you know, the, the fact that the, the wider public um, understanding of green belt is that it's all green and it shouldn't be touched. Whereas in reality, it just happens, you know, there's a lot of defunct buildings and areas that just happen to be within that zone. Um, that are ripe for development and uh, quite frankly an eyesore at the moment. So I do think that from the government from a policy perspective is great. Um, but I think the real bottleneck at the moment isn't just the, the policy side of things, it's the operational side of things. We are hugely under-resourced in our planning departments. The 300... No, no, no. you're going to have 300 new planning 300, offices. which I think is 0.86 per council, yep. um, which won't really scratch the surface. Um, I think that is one of the bigger issues because at the moment we can't get... The, you know, d the delivery time on, on decisions is not eight weeks, you know, which it's meant to be, or 13 weeks for, for 13 weeks for a major application. It's more like you know, three months through to six months. You know, I've had some pre-planning advice applications that have taken 13 months on a single dwelling. You know, because there's under resource and there's such churn in the um, planning offices with planning officers coming and going. So I do think there's there's the, the policy that, that needs to be changing. And you know, I think there's some good ones in there, but there's also the operational side of stuff that, that is needed to deliver any policy that they do, that they do bring in. Well, I, th I think one of the one of the supplemental issues is that if we're going to have 300 new planning officers, are they going to deliver consistent sort of policies throughout the councils and I don't think they are. Um, I, I don't think there's any consistency nation, nationwide. I mean you can have two councils in London have totally opposing ideas of what should and shouldn't be. Oh yeah I mean we see it all the time in, in the architecture practice you know different way you, ha you have to people ask us all the time clients you know it, what's our council like and you know depending on whether you're in Richmond or you know Lewisham you, you'd have a different answer um, you know, how hard it is to get get things through and how realistic um, the planning offices can be. And then you get, then you get the London Mayor jumping in on top of it all and exactly and over, yeah, just overturning saying no. it, just saying no, yeah, quite right. Okay, James, anything to add to that? Uh, I, I just think that the planning officers, they're, they're, they're not necessarily targeted. So for them, like for developers or interior designers, there when you're trying to get something through, it's not just about wanting to uh, for us to make quick money, it's about infrastructure as well, and also just the fact that we're there to create beautiful homes and beautiful spaces. So I just think that they should be targeted or have some incentive to get the planning policy or the planning permissions through in a set amount of time. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I suppose for, to, to, to some degree, uh, planning experts aren't really going to want to work for local authorities, are they? The money's not that good, is it? Well, that's the other issue. No. Where, where are they finding these 300 people from? Because if people wanted to work in the, you know, the public office, um, they would likely already be doing it. So I don't know what incentives there are from the council to bring these people into the, the local council when they can get you know, 60, 75 grand you know, in a private practice as opposed to 40 grand in a public office. Yes. And on on top of which, that that planning office has got to cope with all the 
peripheral sort of agencies, environment agency, whoever deals with contaminated land and that sort of thing. So it's quite a complex business, isn't it? And I've said many times on this programme, again, I, I, I do wonder whether we haven't passed the point where a sort of 12-man lay committee mm -hmm. is able to overturn a professional view and um, just, just cause more and more delays for not always the right reasons. But there we are. Such are, such are the vagrancies of property <laughs> development, I suppose. Okay, right. Um, James, mm. um, in respect of redesign and refurbishment, is there a great deal of difference in taste and style between the north and south of England? Um, I would say yes. Uh, I think north of, the England, north of England seem to be more playful in terms of colour. Um, they like to upcycle more rather than the south. It's for me. I'm what does upcycle mean? Upcycling. <laughs> so uh, I've seen there's various programs on television where someone's jumping into the, the tip or a uh, skip, dragging an old chair and then painting it, re uh, like upholstering it. Right. Uh, they seem to like to use furniture that's already been used in the past. Where I would say the south are more. Scandy, new, they just like to throw money at new furniture and new design. Do you think that's because in the north of England there aren't the sort of um, trendy furniture stores that we've perhaps got down, down here? Probably not so um, Italian orientated, I suppose, I, I could say. I'd say, tend in the north, they're more savvy in regards to how much they want to pay for a particular piece of furniture or designing their house. Um, I think North and South, we're all, a lot of us now want to be living in homes where it's all open plan. Um, the South tend to maybe look at a design or the period of features of a house rather than the North. Yeah, I mean, I suppose that it, it's a sort of mental difference in a way, isn't it? In the North of England, you, you travel up there and you talk about property and then what, what's the interest? What's the, what are you talking about? Why, why am I so interested in property? A house is a house and that's, that's where we live. Down South, it's, it's far more of a, a status symbol, isn't it, I think? Yeah, it's many dinner parties that yeah. I attend, I don't know about you. It's a, always obsession with property. And how much you're and how much make. it is, <laughs> and how much it is, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it's they seem to either want to move to the next house um, where they want to make as much money as they can yeah. and have a, a, a big deal on the I table. Yeah. I think that is the, the the biggest differentiator when you look at some of the kitchens that that some of our clients are installing their houses. That you know, eighty grand, uh, you know, kitchen that that will buy you a house in. Yeah. Sunderland, you know, and that, that's the difference. They have to be a bit more frugal with things because it doesn't warrant spending the money on a house that's worth no. you know, 70 well, I could certainly think of places in the north of England where if you spent £80,000 on a kitchen, you'd end up in a white jacket being, <laughs> being, being sectioned probably. Yeah, wouldn't? that's the difference in, 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 well, not just mentality, but the, the, the sort of socio-economic sort of differences. Well, yes, I, I, I suppose that, that's another important point, isn't it? As, as developers are all taught not to go past the bounds of the geographical area. So, you know, there's, there, there is a glass ceiling on prices in certain areas. And of course, in the north of England, things are very much cheaper and, and that glass ceiling is a lot lower, isn't it? I mean, I, yeah, I've watched a lot of homes under the hammer, for example, seeing, you know, they, they say, oh, how much are you looking to spend on this? They say £4,000 to refurbish the whole house. And I'm thinking, <laughs> that doesn't one room down here, you know, yeah. I can't get my bathroom well, if you're for lucky, that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't even get the consultant to come to the house. To <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, that, that's interesting. And do you, do you think that, it, I, I know we've been through, um, I'm going to turn this carefully, I, I'd say a slack time in property sales and, and delivery of new developments. Do you think that's changing at the moment? Are, are we still on a, an upward trajectory? I'm seeing a, a change, yeah. Um, as I was sort of touching on earlier, we've, we've got a site that's uh, off plan. We've managed to secure four sales of nine. Um, without a formal launch. We've got 12 people for a viewing this Saturday um, for the remaining units. Um, and offers are coming in at, at our asking price level. So 
with the interest rates dropping um, and there being a little bit more positivity, I think, in the market, I think we are seeing a bit more uh, people taking their hands from out under their bums and actually making decisions and moving forward because they can see um, some positivity in upwards trends. I think to a degree, people are just tired of doing nothing, aren't they? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is great for us. You know, the past year has been very, very difficult with people sitting on their hands and not doing anything because you know they literally cannot afford to buy into what the interest rates were a year ago and no. the uncertainty of where the market was going to go. So, yeah, long may it continue because we've got a number of units coming to uh, the market next year. Okay. Anything to add to that? I just think there's whenever we're looking at buying property or whoever is looking, there's always going to be one reason why they want to hold off. Like soon now we've got the budget. So, you know, like it's good news for you, obviously, for, uh, for your sales or uh, viewings. Um, but yeah, I'd like to see the market get a bit more exciting um, and see more sales coming through. Um, yeah. And do, you, do you think it is the budget at the moment that's just dampening it slightly? Yeah, I think there's a lot of stock on the market, which people and investors want to sell very quickly because obviously we've got this 40% capital gains. Well, potentially. Have we? I was going to say. I don't, yeah, potentially. <laughs> There's a lot of hype about it anyway. Who have you been anyway. talking to? Yeah. <laughs> no, I've been reading a lot. <laughs> no, I, I, I think you're right. Because, I mean, the original sort of buy-to-let ethos was that you, you, you buy a property, you let it out, which is welcome, you know, more stock into the rental market, which should keep prices fairly controlled. Um, but at the same time, you've got going on the capital gain, haven't you? And if, if, if the tax goes that goes up that that much it's going to take a lot of people out of that market it, 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 which will add to the people that were taken out of the market because of all the refurbishment and, and uh, insulation EPC. yeah mm-hmm. insulation yeah. problems so I, I think we're in sort of quite tetchy times and I think if we're not careful we're going to alienate a lot of landlords who could be providing you know, welcome rental stock. I mean, we, we've been hounded as landlords over the last five years with the Section 21 tax changes. Um, there seems to want to be a need from the government to push towards more corporate sort of in, um, institutional type landlords, which cuts out people like us, which are, are, are creating really quality, good stock for people. Well, you know, you know why? Because it's easier to collect tax from a limited company and yeah. understand it and check their accounts and, and make sure you can't be a sort of one, one-off landlord just pocketing a bit of tax-free rent mm-hmm. but I do I do wonder overall if 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 we're not heading for a situation where this business of selling your own home at whatever profit you make is tax-free I don't know how sustainable that is nowadays probably wouldn't be a very popular no, certainly not. <laughs> sort of change but I can see it coming yeah, yeah. anyway on that note um, we're going to go to a break so join me after the break when I'll be asking Ben and James more of your questions Hello and welcome back to part two of Property Question Time. I'm Stephen Galpin and I'm joined by Ben Richards and James Costello. Gentlemen, uh, your next question, Ben. Mm -hmm. With eco-stroke green innovations being incorporated in modern building design, what can be done to offset the associated increase in construction costs? And I I imagine that's both increased material costs and also time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, um, there's not a lot you can offset. Um, I think the offset is is more macro than that in terms of increased sales prices to sort of help gain back some of that cost as, you know, instead of a diminishing profit margin, for example, you know, I have read that putting PVs on your roof, solar panels might add 5% to your you know, gross development value, which um, from a perceived value perspective is great for a buyer and everyone's a lot more cautious now on their the money in their back pockets and how much they spend on energy with energy prices increasing so i do think um that that there's not a huge amount that can be done to reduce bill costs or offset those bill costs other than um buying well as a developer Um, that's more difficult because landowner expectations are still sky high in terms of what they think the asset is worth or the property is worth Um, and they uh, those land prices haven't um, haven't moved with the times. You know, when when you used to build at maybe forty percent of your cost might be your build cost, you're now at fifty, fifty-five percent of your build cost. So it always used to be a, a, a sort of maybe 
10 years ago, or maybe even five years ago, developers were sort of a third, a third, a third. You have, you know, a third purchase, a third build cost, and then your third is your profit. That profit is diminishing greatly. That 33% build cost has gone to 50, 55, you know, sometimes 60%, depending on what you're doing. Um, So what's happening? And land, I mean, land cost, um, purely land cost might be at 20, 25%. You know, if you're buying land at that value nowadays, you're probably just about doing okay. Um, Whereas, you know, where it used to be at, 35 you know 37 percent sometimes um those days are gone because build costs are so high with the government changes to increase insulation u- utilize the renewable technologies that that could add 10 15 percent on your build costs alone De- development taxes and all the all the other section 106s mm-hmm. civil payments all of the, all of those other things you know becoming a developer is way harder than it was 10 years ago um and the eco credentials are are needed um but I do think there's the, the the market hasn't picked the market hasn't kept up to speed or, or expectations of sellers vendors um, haven't realigned with the additional bill costs. Hmm. Um, and is that going to get better or worse? So are we just going to see a backing away from green credentials? We can't, unfortunately. There's there's not really any um, from a building control perspective. It's very clear what needs to happen in new build properties and refurbishments. The level of insulation required is more, the, the ventilation requirements are more, the renewable technology needed is to, to achieve the targets are you know, more and more expensive. Um, so there's, there's no really backing down from it. It's not a case of um, you know, wanting to do it anymore. You need to do it to actually achieve the building regulation sign off that you need. Mm. And again, we, we talked in an earlier question about consistency across the country. Are, are the regulations required, are they consistent throughout every authority? They're consistent throughout. Um, and, and that is one thing that's kind of good about the building regulations. There's not a huge amount of subjectivity. Planning, mm. you know, you can get one, one planning officer that's got out the wrong side of the bed compared to another one, and they, they, they give you different view, viewpoints. Whereas with building regulations, it's very clear, it's all written down, you know, if you achieve this new value, which is the thermal properties of a, of a wall or a roof, then, you know, you're, you're compliant. Yes, there's lots of other stuff involved in that process, but it's very clear and very methodical so you know you've got your guidelines to to meet um, there's not subjectivity involved so it's the same in the south of england as it is for the north and i don't really understand how they can build houses in the north because of how expensive it is compared to what the value is of the end product and are the requirements the same for new build as for ref- refurbishment no they are different so new build requirements are far more um uh, intensive um i mean that being said they're both now way more in- in- intensive than they were Two years ago when the new regulations came out but new builds you know the thickness of our walls now are you know 50 mil 60 mil higher, thicker than what they used to have been three years ago um, to get the levels of insulation for example um, whereas from an extension if you're extending your home um, the regulations aren't quite as restrictive but they're still way more than they are two two three years ago and does we, we just talked about the money side of it but does it does it take extra time to implement all these regulations um uh, not too much, to be honest. I think it's more of a cost issue more than a time issue. You know, if you if you if you were installing a gas boiler, it might have taken you you know two days to to fit and commission. If you're installing an air source heat pump, it's you know two days to install and commission. So, it's not I would say a huge time issue. It's more of a cost implication because a boiler might cost you two thousand pounds to install. An air source heat pump might cost you eight thousand pounds to install. Um, which I don't really believe air source heat pumps are the way to go. I think they're still um, way more expensive than than running a gas boiler. But I understand the need to kind of move away from fossil fuels and, and, and direct things to electrics. But I think I think over the next couple of years, we'll start to see some quite innovative um, new technologies come out. Uh, I mean, James, do, do you have the same sort of problems? I mean, I know you're very heavily into uh, refurbishment and redesign of, of, of properties. Do, do all these regulations, these new regulations affect you? Yeah, we have to be constantly informed and reading on the new installation, what's required, working uh, closely with building control, making sure that we get sign off. Um, what we tend to find quite difficult if we're working for a client and we're refurbishing someone's Victorian house is passing on those costs and trying to justify why the loft insulations are going to cost them X when all they want to do is try and minimise what, what they want to spend. Because 
they don't necessarily, the client doesn't necessarily see insulation when it's behind the wall. Are, are, but, we, get, are we getting conditioned to this? So, I, I, so I, I'm just imagining a client sitting in front of you and say, well, look, here, here, here's the cost of making this building look aesthetically brilliant. That, that's part of my job as a designer. Mm -hmm. um, but also I've got to make it efficient and come in with the right green credentials and do you get a sort of well uh, you, you know we I'm not worried about that it's just make it look good yeah so they'll say like we said earlier they'll spend 80,000 pounds on a kitchen because it all looks lovely shiny and good quality but when you're saying well you need to spend 10 12,000 pounds on loft insulation or underfloor heating they're like well I don't see that so can we just brush it under the carpet mm. but then they'll be the first ones to complain if their heating bill is sky high sky high yeah yeah okay do you think do you think um perhaps a question to both of you do you do, do you think the government tests these new ideas satisfactorily i mean you're saying about heat pumps etc do you do you think the government have looked into it deeply enough to to, to push this sort of? They've done a change? lot. Of, they have done a lot of research, but I, I do think some of it's flawed. Um, I mean, the the whole EPC, um, you know, Energy Performance Certificate, and the SAP assessment, which is the standard assessment procedure, which feeds into getting your overall um, EPC rating. It's been flawed for many years. It's not fit for purpose. You know, for sixty quid, you can get an EPC, which is meant to assess. Know, all of the thermal elements within your property and give you an energy rating. There's no way somebody for £60 can go and assess that no. you know, Victorian property in, in, in good time. Um, so I, I do think there's a lot more work that needs to happen on that front. Um, they're changing from, from the EPC process to a home energy model, which is meant to be coming in next year. Um, so there's a lot of change at the moment, but unfortunately the right hand doesn't talk to the left in, in a lot of these situations. They want the new regulation. It's all in good faith, like in, in, in good or meant to be sort of driving in the right direction um, but the other hand can't keep up with those changes so you're left with um, electrical energy um, like heating sources which at the moment even though the government are trying to push towards electric it still performs worse on a you know sap assessment than but, gas but 20 years ago if you went to buy a house and it was all heated and hot water by electricity you wouldn't even buy it would you you say no, no thank you <laughs> can't you convert to gas yeah i mean the the issue is that electric costs are still four times the amount of gas so whether you've got an air source heat pump which is running on electric it's still it's still thereabouts the same as, as a gas boiler um so putting in an air source heat pump costs you probably four times the amount of a, of a gas boiler and you're still paying the same in in, to, in energy prices. Um, so it's, it's, there's a lot of work still to be done. Okay, well, on that happy note. Um, James, hmm. with an acknowledged shortage of labor within the construction industry since Brexit, how can we encourage young people to train and enter the industry? I think mainly we need to make the industry and construction exciting. It's not just about getting down and dirty on site. Um, we've just got to and also learn the technical side of things as well um, and just getting people involved wanting to work in the construction industry just to unite together it's all about wellness at the moment a lot so for our company at the moment we've got this way out wellness we call it so we sit down with our laborers or uh, electricians every week or whenever they want to talk just to let them know that we're next to them, kind of helping them along the way, not just necessarily at work, but also external um, issues as well that they may have. And do, do you experience difficulties in recruiting, re recruiting people? More so now, yes, because I think a lot of them, since Brexit, a lot like we employ 90% of Polish for our, from our side. We've been lucky enough to be keep, keep our staff. Um, we, again, we make sure that they're looked after. But if we need to increase our workforce by another 50%, um, it's a lot of the time, it's kind of word, by, word of mouth through the other guys that are working for us. Yeah. It's, it's, it's quite I, challenging. I mean, I know at one time when, when we were inside the EU, I mean, there were big contracting firms here in Canary Wharf that were actually setting up offices in Poland simply for recruiting tradespeople. And of course, all that's died a, died a terrible death mm. now. You know, we, we're relying on our own endeavours, aren't we? So I think here in the... Well, I speak to our guys who are working 
working for us and they can earn more money at, back at home, say in Poland, than they yeah. are. It's tough here to be, you, you know, the cost of living is astronomical. Okay. Well, it sounds like you look after your people, so well done I to think that. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Okay, well, that's all we've got time for in today's show. So thank you for watching and a big thank you to James Costello and of course, Ben Richards. Uh, thank you both very much for coming in and answering the questions. I'm sure our viewers are very grateful. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Stephen Galpin. Join me again next time on Property Question Time.